Life on the lam might look appealing in the movies, but in reality there are no friends to care for you, no home to call your own, and hope is replaced by fear. So what happens when a man on the run comes to the end of the road? Let's get started. Hello friends, welcome to the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast where we share the gospel of Jesus Christ through the art form of audio drama. Yes, and that includes sound effects. We do this by using true life stories of real people. I'm Timothy Gregory, and I've got a question for you. Are you running from anything? People often run from confrontations, from mistakes they've made, even from themselves. But just like the man in this week's episode, we can't run forever. So what's left for us when there is nowhere left to run? When we come to the end of our rope, or the end of ourselves? That's the topic awaiting us in this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. It's been said that when you hit rock bottom, there's nowhere to go but up. And yet, no one ever says how to get up. How does one do that, get up? The man in this week's episode hit a dead end when he ran out of resources, energy, and most importantly, hope. Also, you want to stick around because later we are going to give the rest of you an opportunity to enter our sweepstakes drawing for a prize. No, it's not a cash prize, but it is a prize, and I think it's a prize you are really going to like if we draw your name. But first, let's get to it, folks. Part 3 and the conclusion of the classic true story of Harold Sullivan. George? Yes, sir. Good day, Mr. Sullivan. Anything I can do for you? Uh, where's my car? I don't see it. Oh, right, sir. I put it in the parking area right after you arrived. I didn't know you'd be using it so soon again. I'll run and get it. No, no. That's all right. I'll take care of it. It's in the usual place. Same as always, sir. Good. I'll just walk over there myself and get it. See you next time, George. better, Mr. Sullivan? Yeah. Thanks, nurse. There are constables out in the hall waiting to talk to you. Oh, yeah? Rude they were. I told them they'd have to wait. You need your rest. Thank you. I mean, it's not every day someone's trying to kill you. (laughs) I I heard him talking about the bomb in your car. Oh, great. Maybe you should leave the country. (laughs) How do you think I ended up here? I've been vacationing all over the world for three years now. But apparently, neither time nor money has made a difference. Well, don't you worry yourself while you're on my unit. Get some rest. Nurse, are there any other men out there? I mean, aside from the detectives? Oh, I'll go have a look. Sleep now, if you can. Involved with organized crime, Harold Sullivan had made money his god. But he soon found out that this god couldn't save him. He planned to escape from the hospital, avoiding police and assassins alike. You'll hear how he completed his escape and what happened afterward as we bring you the final chapter of the classic true story of Harold Sullivan, right now on Unshackled. My money and my passports, of which I had several, and all of them false, were in a small satchel in my hotel room. The first thing to do was to get that satchel. Why, Mr. Sullivan, I heard you've been killed. Not quite, but I will be if the guys who planted that bomb catch up with me. Wow, just like an American gangster film. Shh, keep it down. Listen, there's a small black satchel in my room. Go go see if Susie's at the bar. If she is, get my key at the desk and have her go up and bring me that bag. Right. Five minutes later, I had the bag and was on my way. Two taxis later, and wearing a suit that had been bought for me by one of the drivers, I walked up the gangplank of the ugliest and rustiest-looking tramp steamer at the Melbourne docks. Can I help you, sir? 
Yeah, I'm looking for the captain. You have found him. I am the captain. Are you about to sail? Very shortly. Can you take a passenger? Uh, we are not really a passenger ship. What if the price is right? Come with me. We'll make out arrangements in my cabin. Good. Oh, I forgot to ask. Where are we sailing for? <laughs> oh, you're not joking. I thought you knew. This is a Filipino ship. Our destination is Manila. And so for months, I became a tramp steamer traveler, also alternating with airlines. More than once, I flew by jet over a thousand miles of open ocean. The flight lasted less than three hours, and then I backtracked by ship to my starting point on a voyage of nearly four days. All that time, I was never free of the fear of death. I was sure the men who had spent three years tracking me down to Melbourne would find me again. In December of 1964, more than four years from the time I had fled from Chicago, I was in Rome. I stayed there only a short time, then made a reservation on a flight to Paris. I checked out of my hotel and stood on the curb to hail a taxi. Do you wish a taxi, senor? I do, but I'm not having much luck. They should be one around the corner. Ugh, wait here. I'll go bring it. Thank you. And hurry, please. I don't want to miss my plane. Whoa. Whoa! 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 Oh, whoa. Oh, what happened? How did this happen? DC car, driven by some idiot, skidded right up onto the sidewalk and struck the man as he was standing here. Oh, oh no, poor fellow. And I was trying to get him a taxi. Oh, he doesn't need it now. I must call an ambulance. When the car came up onto the sidewalk, it knocked me through the plate glass window of the hotel. Again, I regained consciousness in a hospital bed. I'll never know for sure whether I was struck accidentally or deliberately. At least no one tried to harm me during the two weeks I was in the hospital. Even so, I was afraid to stay so long in one place. So, when the night came that I found myself strong enough to walk, I again snuck out of the hospital. An hour later, I was on a plane to Paris. I stayed there a few days and rented a car and began wandering across the low countries, especially Belgium and Luxembourg. In December of 1965, I knew I couldn't keep running much longer. Five years of high travel expenses and no income had brought me close to poverty. Through all my years on the run, I had never dared to get in touch with any of my relatives. Now though, with my money almost gone, the entire quarter of a million? I took a chance and called my sister in Harrisburg, Illinois. She gave me hope. Sully, come home. I think it may be safe. Are you sure, sis? The mob has a long arm, and I... But, Sully, from what I hear, there were five men who put out that contract on your life. Now three of them are dead, and the other two are in prison serving life sentences. So I decided it was time to take a chance, and I booked a seat on the next available flight to Chicago. I stepped off the plane at Chicago's O'Hare International Airport on December 24, 1965, the same airport from which my wanderings had begun more than five years earlier. There was a change in the air. For one, I was five years older and tired of running. For another, when I had started out in 1960, I had carried a bundle of cash and letters of credit representing more than a quarter of a million dollars. Now I was flat broke. I hitchhiked all the way to Hammond, Indiana and wondered along the way what these Christmas Eve travelers thought of this middle-aged one-armed man. But once in Hammond, I learned a fresh lesson in man's inhumanity to man. Sully, is that really you? Yep. <laughs> I heard you were dead. <laughs> Not quite. Just dead broke. Ah. I, I heard you got a settlement of over 100 Gs for that arm. That was five years ago. What'd you do with all your money? Uh, that's a long story. Yeah, well, I don't really have time to hear it now. Oh, no. I, I didn't come in here to bend your ear, but uh, I was hoping you'd be able to float me a little cash until I can get back on my feet. Uh, sorry, sorry. I, I got a lot of expenses. Well, I'm not asking for much. Just enough to... No! I can't do anything for you. Marv, I did you some favors. I remember. Yeah, yeah, maybe, but that was a long time ago. No can do. 
Sure, I I know, Sullivan. I, you're right. You, you gave me a job when I needed it. You did. You did. But I've poured a lot of booze since then. Anyway, I, I heard you made some enemies, so, you know, I, I, I can't help you. The night manager of a small hotel still owed me a big bar bill from years earlier. He was the only one who didn't turn me away. <sighs> Temperature's going down. Yeah, we're supposed to get an ice storm tonight. Sully, I wouldn't turn a dog out in this weather. That's the first kind word I've heard all day. Mm -hmm. I'll set you up a cot in our supply closet. I mean, it isn't much, but it's better than the street. I appreciate it. Yeah, at least I can do. I just don't understand those other guys. They used to claim to be my friends. Mm -hmm. Some friends are like pennies, two-faced and worthless. Yeah, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Uh, come on, I'll, I'll take you to your closet. I spent the night of Christmas Eve in that oversized broom closet. But I had a friend, and I had a place to lay my head. I thought for a moment things might be turning around for me. Little did I know I'd be spending my Christmas in the hospital. Folks, we'll get back to Harold's story in just a moment, but first... I want to share a bit about how our ministry is able to bring hope to people all over the world. Unshackled is now in its 71st year of spreading the good news through powerful stories about real people. Our success is a result of God's blessing and the involvement of, well, supporters like you. When you contribute to Unshackled, it has a direct impact. Your support allows us to hire quality writers, talented actors, as you can hear, a skilled production team, and a devoted staff. Through your support, we're able to share Unshackled worldwide. So, in order to continue the work of spreading the gospel and allowing us to offer this program for free, won't you consider making a donation to Unshackled? It's really quite easy. All you need to do is click on the live link, if there's one where you're listening, or visit our podcast website at unshackledpodcast.org that's unshackledpodcast.org and then click the donate button or you can always write a check unshackled we take checks you mail that check to 1458 south canal street chicago illinois 60607 we thank you for your partnership in our ministry and now back to part three of the classic true story of harold sullivan <laughs> The next morning was cold and clear, and everything outside was coated in a thick layer of ice. When I walked out into the street, I slipped and severely twisted my ankle. The pain was excruciating, and I knew the ankle should be taped. The health center operated by the city was open even on holidays, and it took a lot of painful hobbling to get there, but I made it. The woman in charge, uh, Mrs. Patterson, remembered me from the old days. And I would say, Sully, if you can afford to donate enough money for one food basket for some poor family, maybe you could afford two. Yeah, I kind of remember. And do you remember what you'd say back? Um, not really. Well, you'd say, well, ma'am, why don't you make it four and then wait twice as long before you hit me up again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I was high on your list of live ones. Oh, you never turned me down. Not once. Now, let's tape that ankle. Oh, it's swelling badly. I know. Sully, why don't you go to the rescue mission? No, I'm not a drunkard. I just need a job. I didn't say you were, but those people will give you a place to stay and food. They'll give you something else you need, too. Yeah? What's that? They'll introduce you to Jesus Christ. I went back to the hotel, sat in the lobby, and thought about what Mrs. Patterson had said. At last, I decided to go to the rescue mission and just look it over. I did, too, like a man casing a bank he plans to rob. Just inside the glass door looking out stood a man who was at least six foot four who wore a burr haircut. He watched me go past twice. The third time, he opened the door and approached me. A uh, fella, are you looking for something in particular? Uh, I'm just being nosy. Oh, well. Come on in. You, you must be freezing. That man was Johnny Colston, 
assistant pastor of the First Baptist Church of Hammond and superintendent of the Hammond City Rescue Mission. We sat in his office and I told him my whole story. At the end, there were tears in his eyes when I asked, can you help me? No, I can't, but I can introduce you to someone who can. Sully, what do you know about this Bible? Not much. It's God's word, and it's all true. It doesn't tell you everything you might want to know out of curiosity, but it does tell you everything you need to know to live at peace with God and with yourself and to have eternal life. I've never been at peace with God, myself, or anyone else. Do you know why? Hard knock life, I suppose. Mm, sure, but even that is only a symptom of the real trouble. <laughs> What's my real trouble? Sin. God created man for eternal life and for fellowship with himself, but he also created man with a free will. And man used that freedom to rebel and set himself up as God. The infection of sin has been handed down ever since, and it brings death and confusion. What? You're saying we're all sick? With sin. But God has provided the remedy in his son, Jesus. You see, as you are, you can't possibly enter the kingdom of God. Jesus stated it this way in John 3.3. 3. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again, huh? Exactly. This new birth is of the Holy Spirit, not of the flesh. Uh, then a few verses later, Jesus said, Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Huh. Even a guy like me? <laughs> You're no different at heart from anyone else. Here, it says in Romans 3, 23. Uh, well, you read it. Uh, all right. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not as far short as I have. <laughs> Even so, God sets the same standard for all of us. But here's what he's offering. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What about all my old sins? You can be a new man in Christ, Sully. Jesus went to the cross for your sins, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. I want to be new. All right. Shall we pray? What do I say? Just talk to God and mean what you say. All right. God, uh, I place my life in your hands. What you want me to do, I'll do it. Knowing that I can't trust myself or anyone else, I put all my trust in you, Jesus. God has already done miracles in your life, Sully. He allowed you to reach a place where you had to run for your life. And he allowed you to lay hands on enough money, even though it was mostly ill-gotten, so that you could run. But he hasn't allowed you to keep a dime of it. It's a new start. And with God's help, it will be a good one. Since the mission was connected with the First Baptist Church of Hammond, I arranged to be baptized there and began helping out at the mission. The pastor counseled with me. God hasn't done so much to bring you to Christ without a good reason. A new life is reason enough. I agree. But a wise old Scotsman once wrote that God has a plan for career as well as character. With your background, with your knowledge of people in desperate situations, you can be greatly used. Well, I do see that some of the men here are willing to listen to me. I suppose they trust me. Then learn every phase of the work of a rescue mission. Learn how to reach the men on the street even more effectively. That's what the mission is all about. You think that's where God wants me to be? He'll let you know.
God did let me know, with wonderful blessings. I was able to lead up to 10 men to the Lord each week. You'd think a man would be content with such a situation, but I became ambitious. After three years, I heard of an opening for a mission superintendent in a nearby city. I was sure I could get it, but I did not pray and ask for God's guidance. It was my idea, I carried it out, and my plan succeeded, but I failed. I was there for 10 months and did not win one soul to Christ, not one. And because of my failure and the nagging knowledge that I had taken the bit in my teeth and run my own way, I became an unbearable personality. One day as I was going out of the mission, the clerk innocently asked, Will we see you here tomorrow, Sully? Not if I can help it. Oh, are you taking a day off? It's none of your business, Carl. What's wrong with you, Mr. Solomon? Let me tell you something. There isn't a better man in the country than you. But you wouldn't have all this trouble if you was in God's will. That hit me right where I lived. If that confused drunk knew what was wrong and I still refused to admit it, then I was in deep trouble. I went out, started my car, and drove off. I don't know how many miles I covered, but not as many as you might think because most of the time was spent in prayer. It was dark when I finally parked my car close to a water filtration plant on the Hammond East Chicago lakefront. I walked down to the water's edge and prayed more. After a while, the moon rose to my right and began moving upward in the sky. I remained on my knees in the sand. Lord, I'm a stubborn and stiff-necked man. Now I know it, and I'm ready to submit to your will. Put me back where you want me, Lord. Wherever it is, and whatever it is, that's where I want to be. Somewhere out on the lake, a bank of fog arose and started the foghorn. The moon crossed the sky, and still I stayed and prayed. When at last I turned from the water and walked toward my car, a man came out of the filtration plant. Sully? Is that you, Sully? Yes. Why? Well, I thought I recognized you. I've been watching you for hours. Oh, I, I know you now. We met at church. Right. And uh, I need your help. Huh? Uh, there's a man working in the basement who needs to be dealt with. He desperately needs to know the Lord, but I can't seem to make any headway with him. Would you try? Of course. Where is he? The man led me down to the pump room. There, we found several inches of water on the floor and a young man in a hard hat wearing rubber boots and wading from pump to pump. Looks rather bleak down here. Well, it's a pump room. What do you expect? And three of the pumps have died, so it's going to get bleaker. Well, friend, have you any idea what's going to happen to you when you die? It's a serious question. Every one of us is just one heartbeat from death. Son... If you walk away from me, I'll only follow you. This is too important to pass by or to ignore. What are you going to do about Jesus? Look, mister, I don't know who you are, but I do know that you're going to get your feet wet. Why don't you go back up the stairs? Friend, my feet are already wet, and I'd wade up to my neck if it would help me get you to understand that you need Jesus Christ in your life. Who are you, anyway? Just a man. What kind of man would follow me around in this flooded basement? A sinner, saved by grace. But ask me another. Ask me what kind of a savior my Lord is. That's what I want to tell you about. Praise the Lord, that young man received Christ. After 10 months without a convert, I was being shown that back in the will of God, I could again be used. I went back out on the beach and completely rededicated myself to Christ. What I said was, anywhere, Lord, anywhere at all. Anywhere eventually proved to be the city rescue mission in Lansing, Michigan. Then I made my way back to Hammond, Indiana, where I served as an associate pastor, as well as director of the Hammond City Rescue Mission, where I was led to Christ. God has given me a wonderful wife and family and peace of mind beyond anything I ever dreamed of. I spent years in fear of man and ignored God. 
But Jesus told us this, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. What about your soul? Where are you headed? Now is the time to settle the question that I failed to settle for far too many years. Now is the day of salvation. Friendless, homeless, and hopeless, Harold hit rock bottom. But it was there he discovered that Jesus is the rock at the bottom, a firm foundation on which to lose the old self and start anew. In Matthew 7.25, Jesus refers to a man who built his house on a rock, saying, And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. When we found our lives upon Jesus, we have a stable shelter, and like Harold, we don't have to run from the mistakes that chase us anymore. So when you can't run any longer and you reach your lowest point, there is Jesus ready to build your life into something from which you don't want to run. Now, we love hearing from our listeners here on the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, so send us your questions and we'll answer them here. It can be something you're curious about or just something you want to share with us. All you have to do is write us at podcast at unshackled.org or call and leave us a message at 312 312- Two eight one one two six four. We'd love to hear from you, but in the meantime, here is a fact about Unshackled. Did you know that since the beginning of Unshackled, we've gone out of our way to hire professional actors for our Unshackled programs? We strive to do these stories justice, and by hiring professionals, we can produce quality content for our listeners. Now, before we get to our sweepstakes drawing info, I just want to remind you to subscribe or like our Unshackled audio drama podcast. You can even share it or tell a friend. We'd also love for you to review or rate our podcast. And don't forget to check out our other podcasts on this same platform, Unshackled Daily Devotionals and Unshackled in Person. We appreciate your input and involvement in our ministry. And again, please consider supporting us so we can freely offer quality Christian programming to the world. Okay. Here's the prize for our upcoming sweepstakes contest, a beautiful wooden scripture plaque. And I believe the scripture on this uh, particular plaque is Psalm 4610, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the earth. Folks, this is a gorgeous plaque, especially if you're looking for uh, daily inspiration from scripture. You will love this authentic and Um, very unique wooden plaque. The plaque has been sawn from a tree branch or a log uh, and cut in such a way to retain as much of the bark around the perimeter as possible. I didn't actually witness that happening, but I can assure you it did. It's been handcrafted around the natural character and the beauty of the wood that God created. So all you have to do to enter our unshackled audio drama podcast sweepstakes drawing, (gasps) that's a mouthful, is call 312-281-1264 or email podcast at unshackled.org and give us your name, phone number, and email. Your name, phone number, and email. The winner of this sweepstakes uh, drawing for this beautiful scripture plaque will be announced on July 26th. But the deadline for entry is July 21st. The deadline for entry, July 21st. And next time... Is that our boat, Mom? I think so, Ricky. Let's find out, son. Ahoy there, the Patsy Ann! Ahoy, Randall family! That's us! (laughs) A holiday fishing excursion brings together an unlikely group of people. Uh, Now that we're underway, introductions are in order. This is Dr. Arthur Bender and his wife, Susan. Bender? That name's familiar. Bet you never expected to set sail with a famous theologian. That's it, of course. Dr. Bender, I've I've always wanted to interview you. Then you two should get along well. My husband loves to talk. Guilty as charged. (laughs) Are you a writer? News reporter. Lance Crandall. And this is my wife, Amy. Hi. 
And that's our son over there, Ricky. When they face an unexpected storm. That storm's coming in fast. Oh my. Will their 4th of July ever be the same? Find out on the next Unshackled. Heard in part three of the classic true story of Harold Sullivan were Stephen Spencer, Demetrius Troy, Jim Craig, Tom McElroy, Marcy Mencotti, and Evan Armacost. Original music and audio engineer Don Badorf. Sound effects, Demetrius Troy. Recording engineer David Pierczynski. Script, Jack O'Dell and Timothy Gregory. That's it for this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. So until next time, unless our Lord returns before then, I'm Timothy Gregory, your brother in Christ. <laughs>